Welcome everyone to our study of Journey Without Goal, the Tantric Wisdom of the Buddha by Chigyam Trungpa Rinpoche. Just check if the sound is all right. Okay. Seems to be good. Great. Excellent, excellent. Perfect. Good. All right. So, um, Journey Without Goal is an exceptional presentation to the, to the view and the spirit and the method of Vajrayana. Um, we very often talk of the Vajrayana as something that needs to be um, approached with a certain degree of caution. And we very often would say that actually to engage in Vajrayana study, we would need to have been empowered uh, by a teacher, which means that we should have established a relationship um, of understanding of the Vajrayana, as well as a complete trust and confidence that has led to a teacher actually inviting us in to the Vajrayana world. And this, of course, is because the Vajrayana is very easily uh, misunderstood. So, um, so we have a certain degree of caution around the Vajrayana. On the other hand, it's also indis indispensable that we actually know what Vajrayana is. And in the modern world, with our incredible um, array of communications and the sort of multi-global uh, interaction, then Vajrayana um, is something that is certainly not a secret and also then very often is hijacked and presented in ways that, that are very confusing. And that's why we're very fortunate then when we have something like the journey without goal where without actually going into Vajrayana method as such and without spilling the beans around Vajrayana practice at the same time also there is then a, a clarification of what we mean with Vajrayana what is the Vajrayana what is very important uh, to understand about Vajrayana is that it's no different from everything we do uh, in Buddha Dharma regardless of the various Buddhisms that we have throughout various cultures and also the various approaches within Vajrayana, all these various um, vehicles and paths are all intended towards just one thing, which is eliminating the confusion that causes the suffering uh, of samsara. So the intention of Buddhism everywhere is to uncover a natural disposition that is unconfused and basic to us. And this is what all the various um, methods that we find in Buddhism everywhere does. So there's, you could say the objectives of Buddhism everywhere is exactly the same. The methods might differ. And of course, where, when we talk about Vajrayana, we very often understand Vajrayana um, in terms of what we call the resultant approach. So we can talk about two ways of approaching this nature that's innate to us. Just like if we, if we have an illness, we can see ourselves and we can define ourselves as patients, but we can also define ourselves as innately healthy persons that simply are ill for the time being. And when we look at the foundational teachings of all the all Buddhism everywhere, the Four Noble Truths, we can see that in fact the the um, the truth of suffering, um, the fact that there is confusion that we humbly have to acknowledge, which leads to our um, us being caught in a cycle of of painful existence. Um, this is a situation that can be remedied. And that's the third noble truth, the truth of cessation. And then there's a, the, the cause then of that, what then leads to cessation, which is then the path. But it's very important that we understand that um, everywhere in Buddhism, we see ourselves as 
as um, having a workable situation. Of course, when we're ill, it's important that we deal with the conditions of our particular illness, but that doesn't necessarily need to mean that we need to define ourselves in terms of being patients. Likewise, also in the Buddhist teaching, we have the gradual approach, which is very much about the um, common sense of dealing with our confusion, working with it, understanding that we are confused individuals and that we need to uh, work with the causes and conditions of that. But at the same time, we do so with the understanding that unconditionally there's a ground within us that is ever untarnished, uncorrupted, and basically who we truly are. And that's the vision of the Vajrayana. So as much as the entire Buddhist path operates with an, uh, an understanding that we need to de deal with our confusion, we also do so with the understanding that basically our disposition is innately pure. And so we could say there's not, every, any, there's not anywhere in the Buddhist teaching that we don't actually have this so-called resultant uh, approach where we have this vision that innately we possess this purity. But of course, there's differences in the methodologies that we then have in the approach that comes from the point of view of us needing to gradually work with confusion. And then the approach that operates with a vision that this nature, this uncorrupted quality of enlightenment that is innate to us um, and known as Buddha nature, this is then we could say our starting point. And so in Tibetan Buddhism, we have this very pragmatic approach of combining both the understanding of the, um, the gradual path, the gradual approach to enlightenment, and also then the resultant approach, the recognition that our um, innate ground is uncorrupted. So Tibetan Buddhism has this very pragmatic unity of what we call the approach of then what is what is referred to as sutra, which is referred to as is how we understand the, the, the understanding of the gradual path or um, the general path of what we call the path of the causal path of characteristics, and then the resultant path of Vajrayana or the tantric path. So if we look at the legacy that we have from the uh, Tibetan masters who have taught in the modern world, we see that they very much in part these two approaches. And if we look at the approach of Chögyam Trungpa, it was very much based on a solid grounding in understanding the, um, the gradual path, um, combined then also continually with inviting into the Vajrayana vision. And in fact, the more we understand the Vajrayana, then the more we can actually see how all the various teachings that come from Trungpa Rinpoche and also other Vajrayana masters, invite us in and are continually referring to the vision of the Vajrayana. Um, so, so, the, so this study here um, makes a lot of sense, I think, in terms of many of us are practicing the tantric preliminary practices or many of us are practicing sadhana. Um, again, coming back to the fact that Vajrayana very often is confused and misrepresented and hijacked in so many different ways, then it really makes a lot of sense for us to, um, to look at then the, the words of a great Vajrayana master, a great Buddhist master, and um, spend some time seeing what, what, um, what has to be said about this from the authoritative source. So, um, Journey without goal, the tantric wisdom of the Buddha, then um, the notion of journey is very much the notion that annoyingly you could say the Buddhist, the Buddhist path is not such that if we just subscribe to being Buddhists and that we sign up and so forth, that we are basically, uh, everything's well. We actually have to undertake the journey ourselves. We have to be proactive. So just the other day, we were, I was looking at Stephen Goodman's work on Abhidharma, and he made the interesting observation that the Sanskrit term marga for path also implies not just that there is a path, 
but also that there's a journey that needs to be um, undertaken. And so here then, presenting the tantric wisdom of the Buddha, then we are presenting then the, the Vajrayana. So one thing also that's, that um, the lineage masters will always encourage before we begin any study is really to recognize the universal relevance of what we're studying. We're not just studying a topic that's specific for us in a little isolated community of Buddhist practitioners, but we really have a science that goes to the bottom of where suffering universally originates. We're not operating from the point of view of a belief system or some cultural practices, but we're really operating from the point of view of an empirical science that looks at what happens in terms of our consciousness and what are the causes and conditions that work with it. So in this sense, we can say that the Buddhist science of the mind is empirical in that it doesn't operate from the point of view of belief systems or metaphysical assumptions, a priori positions of any kind, but rather it is about an investigation and a, um, a working with something that we can directly observe and work with. And that is then what we're doing when we're um, approaching the study of the path. And we do so specifically then from the point of view that there is, there is suffering universally that can be addressed. And in this way, what we're, what we are, um, what we're studying and what we're practicing on the Buddhist path is something that applies universally for everyone everywhere. The suffering of, um, of all sentient beings originates from this cognitive dysfunction that is exactly what we're addressing on the Buddhist path. So what we're doing here really is something that uh, has relevance for um, us understanding the conditions of others, sentient beings, living creatures everywhere at all times, and us making actually in ways in terms of understanding what is happening um, in terms of us either sort of going in the direction of suffering or in the direction of freedom. It enables us to gain experience that will have relevance for others. So we very often would say to approach the study of the teaching, um, and also the practice of the teaching with this attitude that we call preparation with bodhicitta, that our, that our motivation for this study uh, is very much informed by understanding how suffering exists universally and the intention then to remedy this situation. So that kind of magnanimous uh, attitude is based should then be, um, or rather if we have that, then the value of our study is um, far greater. So um, here we have the author. I apologize, the photo is slightly blurry, but I like this picture. So um, I thought we could have that with us as we're doing the study. So um, I'd actually like to go to begin with the um, with the introduction of Chukum Trungpa himself. I'd also like, just like to pay homage to Carolyn Rose Gimian, uh, who together with some of the other students of Chukum Trungpa, like Judith Leaf, have really been instrumental in um, presenting Trungpa Rinpoche's legacy uh, to a larger audience. Um, Trungpa Rinpoche was incredibly active during the years that he taught, and there's an enormous amount of recordings. But to actually put these into a uh, sort of an elegant, legible, accessible form um, is an enormous job. And so um, we're again, as in many in many cases, we were just studying, I think, the, the mindfulness in action, which was also uh, uh, Rose Carolyn Gimian, um, who, um, Carolyn Rose, who, um, who edited that, and similarly also then this present work, so very much indebted to her work. So, introduction then. 
Thumbaram just says, the teachings of the Buddha are a treasury of wisdom that has been passed down from teacher to student for over 2,500 years. Many styles of teaching have developed, but all of the schools of Buddhism present the means to realize the awakened state of mind. And all of them emulate the example of the Buddha, the awakened one. This is a very important point to realize, particularly in the context of this book, which presents Tantra or the Vajrayana teachings of Buddhism. Many people have heard about Tantra as the sudden path, the quick way to enlightenment, or they may have heard that Tantra is a form of free expression or sexual liberation or some kind of full-blown emotionalism. But it's important to realize that Tantra is not separate from the rest of the Buddhist path. Exotic ideas about Tantra are not just misconceptions, they could be quite destructive and both the dangerous and fruitless uh, it is both dangerous and fruitless to attempt to practice tantra without first establishing a firm ground in the basic buddhist teaching so this is of course what i was saying before in terms of buddhism being misappropriated hijacked and so forth and also this is sad because what very often happens is that um, because of the sort of the um, the language that very often tantric practitioners themselves have a hard time actually uh, explaining what tantra is so you have even within the communities of buddhism you have um, those that would think that tantra uh, is is something else is not sort of ordinary buddhism or doesn't actually conform with the rest of the buddhist teachings and of course yes tantra methods are not easily understood, but their objective remains the same. Of course, when you hear Tantra as in Tantric work workshops, where I live in the Byron Bay region, which is sort of a little bit sort of an Australian California, then yes, then the idea of Tantra is very much something to do with free, ex free forms of sex and love and so forth. And in this way, sort of the vision of Tantra is diminished to sort of fit into the agendas of the, of the particular audience. Um, that's where not only we have some misconceptions, but that can be quite destructive. But also then within Buddhist communities, it's really important that there is an understanding um, that Tantra is just as much grounded in the vision of enlightenment as, as all the other Buddhist paths are. So while the methods dif differ, the vision and the basic ground and the basic logic uh, is the same um, all across the board in all the various Buddhist traditions. Thumpa Rinpoche continues, the Buddhist path is traditionally divided into three major yanas or vehicles, the Hinayana, the Mahayana, and the Vajrayana. Now, this is quite particular to Thumpa Rinpoche, actually, because we would very often in the Buddhist teaching, when we talk about the three yanas, uh, from the Mahayana perspective, we talk about Shravaka yana, Prateki Buddha yana, and the Bodhisattva yana. However, Thumpa Rinpoche is referring to then something that is traditionally referred to as the three levels of vows, the individual liberation, the, uh, the path of individual liberation, the, um, the Mahayana, and then the... Um, the um, the vehicle of the vijadharas or the um, those who uh, take take the um, take buddha nature as the path so we have these and they do correspond to then what we call hinayana mahayana and vajrayana of course there's a little bit of a problem with hinayana uh, which very often is um, in a general sense uh, understood to mean smaller vehicle which i think those, tradi those traditions that are sort of associated with the Hinayana probably won't find that amusing. So that's why it's quite, could be a little bit problematic with we, if we equate Hinayana with actual traditions. Hinayana is a very specific term that's quite important, but it really refers more to the foundational aspects. And it's a Mahayana term that then establishes, you could say, the foundational aspects of um, of the Buddhist path. So one of my teachers, Nyusha Kennedy, which he would always refer to these as this as the foundational jnana. But anyway, this refers then to the organic growth that the practitioner uh, goes through, these three vehicles. So Trungpa continues, Hinayana literally means 
the small or lesser vehicle, but it would be more accurate to call it the narrow way. The Hinayana is small or narrow in the sense that the strict discipline of meditation narrows down or tames the speed and confusion of mind, allowing the mind to rest in its own place. The Hinayana is also called the immediate jnana because Hinayana practice allows simple and direct experience of our own minds and of the world. We begin to realize that whatever we experience, whether good or bad, positive or negative, is workable and tameable. So Hinayana is very much beginning and with ourselves and working with our own conditions. So this is an indispensable foundation. Umbramaja continues, as well as the discipline of meditation, the Hinayana also stresses the importance of post-meditation discipline. Discipline in Sanskrit is shila, and in Tibetan it's tsultram. Tsul means proper or appropriate. Tim means regulation or law or norm. So tsultram is practicing proper conduct or proper discipline, according to the example of the Buddha. During his lifetime, the Buddha established disciplinary rules of conduct that are strictly applied in monastic life. These are called the Vinaya in Sanskrit or Dulwa in Tibetan. Both Vinaya and Dulwa literally mean taming. So in general, Vinaya can be understood as any discipline that we practice in order to tame our being. In the Hinayana, the only way to conduct ourselves is according to the message of Vinaya the message of discipline. Through practicing the proper conduct of tsiltram, our body, speech, and mind are thoroughly tamed, and we are able to quell or cool off the heat of neurosis. Because of that, we're able to practice the greater Hinayana discipline of not causing harm to ourselves and others. And finally, based on practicing such total discipline, we're able to achieve what is called individual liberation, pratimoksha or sosotarpa. Individual liberation is a tremendous accomplishment which enables us to express our basic goodness as human beings. So this is where it's quite important that in view of the potentially chauvinist um, um, term Hinayana, that actually um, we need to understand this, this, uh, this smaller vehicle or narrow vehicle really as um, the foundation where we deal with our individual situation and that understand the, the need for actually accomplishing this individual liberation. Of course, to then um, attribute this individual liberation as enlightenment, that is, of course, where the Mahayana begs to differ. But nevertheless, dealing with the individual liberation is, is essential as in terms of, of the path. Okay. Masa comprendas do tantra tembem tem aber from merito karma, no? Hmm. We're going to have to uh, probably use English. I speak a little bit of French and Italian um, and Danish and some of the Scandinavian languages, but I'm afraid uh, my Spanish or Portuguese is um, um, non existent, basically. So <laughs> you're going to have to say that in English. <laughs> anyway, it's fair to say that one, uh, one should, one should uh, so then there's another question. Is it fair to say that one should not embark on the tantric path without understanding shunyata? It seems, mm -hmm. it seems some modern tantric teachers seem to not accept or at least uh, misunderstand shunyata. Well, then it's questionable whether they're actually t Buddhist tantric teachers. They can, of course, you know, we don't really have a proprietary policy in place, you know, that you can't call yourself a tantric teacher. But without, without an understanding of the foundation of shunyata, um, then we don't have tantra as far as the Buddhists are concerned. So, um, so yes, shunyata is essential uh, to the to the understanding of tantra. Yeah, yes. So now we have it 
the Spanish question translated. But understanding Tantra is also about merit and karma, isn't it? Oh, yes, definitely. All of what we, we undertake in terms of the path really depends on um, merit and our karma. I remember Tonsik in Zerimji once uh, when he was teaching Majamika, he said, you think that you can approach Majamika purely as an intellectual discipline, but without actually merit, um, then it's, it's impossible to approach anything and to think that we could just understand Majamika purely intellectually without merit, um, it would be really a flawed approach. Um, and then there's, then there's a question, does that mean individual liberation can be achieved just through Hinayana without Mahayana or Vajrayana? Yes, yes. So, um, so, the, so the path really of individual liberation is the foundation of all Buddhism. It's the, really, the, like Trungpa Rinpoche was saying, that's the references to the, to the, um, to the Vinaya and so forth and, and so on. Then again, right now we are, this discussion is taking place within a Mahayana and Vajrayana context. So we should really, we should really understand this as what Trungpa Rinpoche is doing is really just providing a perspective that includes the foundation. So we're going to have to really see any reference to Hinayana and Mahayana in terms of the Vajrayana. Do Hinayana practitioners achieve enlightenment? By definition, not. We would say they achieve what's called Niroda, the, the condition of the Arhat, which is, we would say, if you're crossing the ocean and you decide to stop on Bora Bora for a while, and you know, that's understandable. At the same time, we would say the, the, the subtle concept of or the, the subtle obscuration of clinging to a self is still present within this notion of, in, of settling in what we would then call um, individual peace. And that's where the individual liberation, this condition of individual peace is still laced with this cognitive obscuration that thinks in terms of I. There's the notion that I have achieved peace and I'm going to stay here. So there's still, you could say there's the peace of not having um, the, the madness and the suffering of samsara, but yet there is still a subtle holding on to phenomena, both in terms of self and also in terms of the phenomenal world, even though it's very subtle. And that is where then we would say the the Mahayana with its complete, um, with its complete uh, absence of any um, with the understanding of shunyata and uh, the understanding of um, the highest degree of no self, and both in terms of individual and also in terms of phenomena, uh, is essential really for achieving complete enlightenment. Um, the following is a question regarding the book cover. Can you explain, please, how the symbol above the title and subtitle relates to this study? Sorry, that's the, the that's the syllable hum. The syllable hum. Uh, is said to be the uh, the, um, the the sound of the wisdom of of enlightenment of the awakened condition. So um, so that's yes the syllable hum. If you're more inclined, as I actually am, to the Tibetan, then we say hum. But either way, um, this is then the symbol of of enlightened mind. Could we say that the three yanas are practiced when we do shamatha vipassana and visualization? Yes, we can. Of course, shamatha and vipassana actually lends itself to uh, all of the three yanas. So in, throughout all the, the yanas, we are practicing shamatha and vipassana. Yeah. Uh, can you elaborate majamika without merit will be flawed? Sorry? Can you elaborate majamika without merit? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Can you? Can you? Can, okay. I, uh, you're asking me to explain a little bit about how approaching Majamika without having the proper merit would be flawed. Yeah. It would really just be that we were objectifying it as an intellectual study, which of course happens, and that's where, without actual experience, then we then we are just. It's a bit like if we're just reading the menu, but we've never actually tasted the food. So, so merit really is the. Um, the conditions that inspire us to 
take majamika beyond just the majamika words into what we call the actual majamika of experience. Um, if understanding terms like shunyata depends on karma and merit, does that mean no matter how hard we practice, it's still difficult for us to realize truth? Well, I wouldn't really give up on, on anything. And I think for us to even be present in this study, we, we have plenty of karma and merit. So <laughs> don't worry about this. But um, it's more just to say that very often when these, these terms have been presented in an academic context, they're done so really without understanding the, the, the application of it. So, you know, we have science, but this science that we have needs to be an applied science. So that's why sometimes these kind of, uh, the idea of shunyata or vajrayana is sort of taken to be a Tibetan belief or a Buddhist belief and so forth. And that's where we can see that it's that you actually need to have something intangible that actually provides the conditions for wishing to um, to actually engage in it. And this is what we then refer to to as um, <clears throat> the dependency on karma and merit. But of course, what's implicit in something like shunyata is that it is we're actually we're actually looking at reality. So of course, yes, there is a place where we could look at this very academically, um, analytically, and say, yes, the nature of reality is shunyata. But to actually take this into the realm of experience, that's where we need some, we need to have, you could say, the, the, um, the openness and the conditions that actually uh, enable us to connect with the sense of, of what's being talked about. Um, so someone says, Jakob, why do the Theravadans not accept Mahayana, uh, and let alone Vajrayana and Tantric vehicles? Well, it's just really that it's lost in translation. Um, then again, the Theravadans, that if we look at Buddhism historically, they're very, they have been very keen on insisting that they're the ones, they're the ones who have the actual text. The Theravadan means the elder ones, but it also refers to that they consider themselves as uh, holding the original teaching of the Buddha, and this, this, um, this sort of um, discourse has has very much influenced also modern or Western understanding of Buddhism, so that we very often talk about uh, original Buddhism or early Buddhism and so on, and um, and uh, at the same time also, um, like I said, and what Tungbrunj's point is that what we have in all the various Buddhist tradi traditions is very much based on the same objective, the same vision. The methods are different, but that's where misunderstandings can happen. So you, yes, you do have some misunderstandings taking place, but you could say that's really just a question of, of language. And I think probably with the sort of a more um, multicultural um, interaction that we have nowadays in the modern world, I think some of these, these all sort of prejudices and misunderstandings are sort of um, sort of <clears throat> giving way to a larger understanding. Uh, at the same time, also I have to say the Theravadan traditions, which by nature actually you think would be incredibly confounded with with Vajrayana and Tantric um, method, there's also a lot of tolerance. You know, this really is this really shows the sort of the lack of dogmatism, and very often within Theravadan practices, there is a respect also for Tibetan teachers. So there's a lot of dialogue really taking place, you know, like in Budgaya every year, uh, sort of you have all the tantric mob come there and do their things, you know, and yet, you know, there's a, there's sort of a live and let live so that, you know, and um, His Holiness the Dalai Lama is hugely respected within the Theravadan traditions and so on. So there is sort of a softness that also runs through this apparent disagreement. Um, okay, I thought the difference between Hinayana and I thought the difference between Hinayana and Mahayana is bodhicitta to liberate all beings instead of liberating oneself. Yes, but that's also implicit in the the vision. You could say the ontological vision or the view uh, of shunyata, because that is also bodhicitta. So it's, when we talk about bodhicitta, we talk about absolute and relative bodhicitta. It's relative bodhicitta that the bodhisattva uh, is 
dedicated to all sentient beings. But that's also the, comes from a place of this absolute bodhicitta, which is this understanding of shunyata. So this is the same thing. Just we need to expand the understanding of bodhicitta. I thought the nirv I thought the nirvana was the realization of non-existence of self and enlightenment included absence of self and phenomena also. Yes. So we would say the the um, the, the nirvana of the uh, of the hinayana uh, doesn't actually have the complete understanding of um, of emptiness or the non-existence of self. So that's where um, we would say this niroda or the condition of the arhat is still sort of still has this cognitive obscuration. Uh, about majamika and merit, is the danger or trap we can fall into if we don't have merit? The fact that we could conceptualize the practices of the teachings, that's part of it, yes, very much. Um, and then there's a comment, we can increase our merit. Yes, of course, yes. That's of course, that's implicit in everything we're saying here. We're working with our condition. So whether we're talking about confusion or the path or enlightenment, um, we're talking about something which we can approach through being proactive. So we're on the path, we can, we can work with uh, confusion, it can be eliminated. We can increase our merit, yes. Um, this sounds a little bit like the Old Testament and the New Testament argument, the terrified and being the belief, uh, hold on. This sounds a little bit like the Old Testament and the New Testament argument, the terrified and being the belief in the Old Testament and the Mahayana of Adriana being believes in the New Testament or both Testaments, or both Testaments. This sounds a little bit like the Old Testament and the New Testament argument. I am afraid I have to confess, I can't understand this question, but it's a little bit tricky when we begin to draw parallels across. I think we need to sort of undertake these studies in terms of their own. <laughs> Making parallels can be a bit confusing sometimes. But yes, there probably are parallels uh, across various cultures and so forth. Did the Buddha teach Vajrayana later in his life? It said the Buddha taught Vajrayana on, se on several occasions. Yeah, um, not particularly later. Um, when I was in school, I was only taught this, this is only school. But when I go to one of the Thai tradition, it does give credit to Mahayana schools, especially land of 10,000 Buddha founder. Okay, all right. So that must be in a, I guess, a Chinese or some Buddhist context, yes? Okay. Sometimes I get a feeling that Vipassana of Theravada is where we are getting at ultimately in Tantrayana. Well, not really. Um, Vipassana, um, Vipassana is universal to all of Buddhism. So of course, when we come across some of the Vipassana teachings, um, it really depends on where we're coming from. But we would, we would say that the um, the Vipassana that we have in in the Mahayana um, is quite important in terms of establishing or enabling the experience of then the complete freedom from any conceptual constructs, and that is then what's skillfully further integrated in the practice of the of the Vajrayana. So when we are when we are approaching um, the the Vajrayana understanding of um, vipassana, it's far greater. It basically what we have in the vipassana of the Vajrayana is the understanding of all relative phenomena as being um, inseparable from the original ground, and that's where we have this vision of purity. So in this sense, the Vajrayana vision of vipassana includes then the, the purity of relative phenomena. So it goes far beyond the, the Vipassana that you have in the general Buddhist vehicles. And also there's a more subtle understanding of the, the, uh, the, ultimate, the <laughs> ultimate truth. Can you define merit? 
Yes, the conditions, the good conditions that connect us with enlightenment. So it's a bit more than just karma. It's a bit more than good karma. It's actually the kind of karma or conditions that connect us with enlightenment. So we could even sometimes say that misfortune that might befall us, that lead us to connecting or wishing to achieve enlightenment or connecting with the path, um, that that is an expression of merit. So, for example, if we lose everything and that that brings us to to uh, <clears throat> to the Buddhist teaching, we could say that's that's our merit. You know, we even have prayers where we actually where we aspire that even if um, we even if we have worldly aspirations, may they may they not come to fruition so, so as not to distract us from the path. So merit is a bit more than just good karma. Um, Someone was saying, "I'm so." Oh, that's the question before about the uh, about the Old Testament and New Testament. Uh, autocorrect has gone crazy here. <laughs> okay, please disregard this comment. Okay, cool. Um, were there ter Vajrayana symbols that were found from 2,500 years ago, like Doge, etc.? That I don't know. I, d I don't know, but I think there's a lot of the the sort of the assumptions around Vajrayana as being something later that we can challenge. But of course, there's so many symbols that we engage with in the general Buddhist path, which are, are um, symbols that have come about later on. Mind you, then, depending really what where we're coming from, from the point of view of the, the authoritative scriptures being the sutras or the authoritative scriptures being the tantras. So there's a few differences in perspective here. Anyway, it's important to understand also that the Buddhist teaching is understood in terms of an an open canon in the sense that it's something that responds to the actual needs of beings at particular times. Um, is it possible to limit questions somewhat or perhaps too later to avoid too many sidetracks so that we can continue with the many texts? Yeah, I was just thinking with that actually we do have today is exceptional I guess maybe because it's the first day but I would say please um, can you limit your questions to the um, to the topic at hand? And maybe we can do a question and answer session towards the end. I think we might have to do that. What I tend to have been tend to doing is just taking the questions as they come in, but we might just leave it uh, towards the end. And then if there's an excess of questions, we can take those next time. Yeah. So. Um, so Hinayana doesn't include Buddha nature. Um, well, it does in some way. How do we accumulate more merit? Mm, the practice of the path. Okay, this was short, short question, short answers. All right, but yes, you're right. We 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 get a little bit sidetracked, and we actually want to make some headway in the text. At the same time, also, of course, you are welcome to ask questions. But I'll probably then probably um, do what I sometimes have done to, to really just take the questions towards the towards the end. Okay. Um, okay, so we covered the Hinayana. The Mahayana, or the great vehicle, is like a wide open highway in contrast to the narrow path of Hinayana discipline. The Mahayana goes beyond the Hinayana ideal of individual liberation alone. Its aim is the liberation of all sentient beings, which means that everyone, everything, is included in the vast vision of the Mahayana. All the chaos and suffering of ourselves and others is part of the path. The primary discipline of the Mahayana is helping others, putting others before ourselves. The training of the Mahayana practitioner is to exchange him or herself for others. As a well-known Mahayana slogan, puts it, gain and victory to others, loss and defeat to oneself. However, it should be clear that this attitude is not based on self-denial or martyrdom, but rather springs from the development of genuine warmth and compassion. Thus, the Mahayana is expansive and embracing. Now, this is important. And of course, here, when Trungpa Rinpoche talks about including all sentient beings, this is very much the vision in terms of what we call relative bodhicitta, but that is also how the spirit of the Mahayana differs because it's not so much about us being on our individual path of liberation. Uh, it's very much about us standing in an open relationship with others. 
And Trungpa here quotes uh, Langri Tangba from the eight verses of mind training, with his gain and victory to others, loss and defeat to oneself, that there's this complete letting go of the uptightness around me. And there is this engaging with the world without any reservation. In fact, enlightenment is dedicated to others. So there's a very big difference, and this is where Trungpa Rinpoche then says the Mahayana is expansive and embracing. The third yana, the Vajrayana, literally means the diamond or indestructible vehicle. The idea of indestructibility here is the discovery of indestructible wakefulness, the discovery of our own innate awakened state of mind or Vajra nature. Since this book deals with the Vajrayana teachings, it seems unnecessary to explain too much about them here. However, it is extremely important to understand at the outset that the Vajrayana is a continuation of the previous two yanas and that without proper training in the Hinayana and Mahayana disciplines, it is impossible to step onto the tantric path. So, of course, this is a point that's being made repeatedly here, this point, and um, this is also really essential. Um, for us to understand that Vajrayana is, is in no way uh, something, despite the app apparent, you could say, the accoutrements of Vajrayana, the methods and so forth, Vajrayana is in no way different from uh, the other Buddhist traditions. It's not as if in Vajrayana we've sort of all of a sudden incorporated conveniently deities because we like deities or gurus because we like some sort of cosmic parental figures and so on um not at all but this is also this also reflects the situation that you had in the old india where the vajrayana was kept a little bit secret or discreet because they in a, this the multicultural setting of india there was the possibility that this could be associated um with what it wasn't namely theism and so on so that's where you could say the Indian situation and the modern world situation is quite similar in the sense that with the sort of the many kind of discourses that we have in the um, modern world and which we had in the old India, then very often then Vajrayana could be misunderstood. Tibet was different because Tibet was very much a monoculture in the sense that pretty much everyone in Tibet practice Buddhism, including the Bumpos. There's not really much difference between the Bumpos and the Buddhists. And certainly there was not these misunderstandings taking place around the nature of the Vajrayana. So that's where the openness that you had in Tibet around the Vajrayana um, is, stands apart from the situation that you had in the old India and also what you have nowadays. And that's why it's even more important to make this point about the Vajrayana being founded on the general Buddhist principles. Tantra literally means continuity of thread. Hinayana, Mahayana, and Vajrayana are a continuous thread of sympathy and sanity, which is never broken. Vajrayana is further and greater expansion. It is the expression of greater sanity and greater sympathy arising from the practice of Hinayana and Mahayana. So this continuity and thread, which we sometimes associate with the presence of Buddha nature that abides as the ground within every living creature, um, this then constitutes the continuity, that which runs as the truth throughout both the conditions of samsara and nirvana, this nature which is not improved in nirvana, not corrupted in samsara, um, the degree to which we connect with that, then there is the greater um, vision and the greater experience of the uh, eliminating the confused condition of self-centering and um, cognitive obscuration and so forth. And that's where there is this emerging as we progress along the path of greater sanity and greater sympathy. Trumpa Rinpoche continues, throughout this book, the reader will find numerous warnings about the dangers of Vajrayana and the importance of beginning at the beginning with the practice of meditation. 
When I presented this material at Naropa Institute in the summer of 1974, I felt it was my duty to warn people about the dangers of Vajrayana and also to procla proclaim the sacredness of these teachings, which go hand in hand. And this, of course, is this is all reflected in Chigam Tumba's approach in terms of thoroughly educating his students in, in the the all the foundation foundational aspects of the buddhist teaching um, and we also see this in other um, tibetan buddhist teachers the audience was a very interesting mixture there were many people who we might call spiritual shoppers people sampling tantra as one more interesting spiritual trip there were also a number of people who were quite innocent and open they happened onto this class by various coincidences and had very little idea of what Tantra or spirituality at all might be. As well, there were a number of committed students who had been practicing meditation for some time. It was quite a challenge to present Tantra to such a mixed group, but for all of those people, it was necessary to, but for all of these people, it was necessary to stress again and again the importance of meditation as the foundation of all Buddhist practice and the danger of ignoring this prescription. So again, when, while we very often emphasize that it's important to have the view, to have an understanding, um, this shouldn't lead us to postponing um, the practice of meditation and put that out into the future. From the very start, this practice of grounding ourselves in sanity is essential also to really understanding what is being taught and what's being spoken about. And again, this also refers back to the earlier discussion around merit. There is tremendous merit in the practice of meditation. The entire Buddhist path is based on the discovery of egolessness and the maturing of insight or knowledge that comes from egolessness. In the Hinayana, we discover the non-existence of self through the practice of meditation. Assuming a dignified sitting posture, identifying with the breath, and simply noting thoughts and feelings, basic discursiveness, we begin to make friends with ourselves in a fundamental sense. By applying mindfulness or bare attention to whatever arises during meditation, we begin to see that there is no permanence or solidity to our thought process. And at some point we begin to realize there is no permanence or solidity to us. In Sanskrit, the meditative practice of mindfulness is called shamatha, and in Tibetan it is shine. Shine literally means the development of peace. This, this, the meaning of peace here is precisely the sense of taming the wildness of mind so that we are alert and able to experience ourselves directly. We're not talking about peace as some kind of trance state. Shamatha is the first state. So, sorry, the first step in waking up. The shamatha is then the conditions of us actually connecting with our reality, begin to wake up to our reality, disengaging from this sort of self-absorbed absorbed bubble that we very often are in when we are caught up in our fixating on our particular attitudes, thoughts, narratives, and so on. So shamatha is really breaking away from this distracted state. Mindfulness then, referring to shamatha, mindfulness naturally leads to the development of awareness, which is a sense of expansion, being aware of the environment or space in which we are being mindful. Awareness brings tremendous interest in things, people, and the world altogether. We begin to develop sympathy and caring for others. The practice of awareness in Sanskrit is called vipassana, and in Tibetan, phakton, which literally means clear seeing. Vipassana is traditionally connected both with the practice of meditation and with the formal study of the teachings and post-meditation activities in general. Vipassana provides a link between the insight that is developed in meditation practice and our everyday experience. It allows us to carry that meditative insight or awareness into our daily lives. So Vipassana extends beyond the method, if you like, of 
um, the practice of sitting meditation. So it is the vipassana is really a, has a very um, sort of a broad significance in the sense that it really refers to the result of practice. So it's something that goes beyond the method. It's something that goes beyond the um, session as such, and it's something that really is the insight that we then carry into to life. Through the insight that comes from Vipassana, we begin to make a further discovery of egolessness. We begin to develop a precise understanding of how mind functions and how confusion is generated. We're able to see how the belief in ego causes tremendous pain and suffering to ourselves and others. So that's where Vipassana is, where we begin to have the insight into what drives samsara and what drives nirvana. Tumbramji continues, from this comes the desire to renounce samsara, the wheel of confused existence, the world of ego. Renunciation is expressed as the desire to refrain from harming ourselves and others. As well, we begin to long for the path that will liberate us from confusion. We begin to develop confidence in the Buddha as the enlightened example, in the Dharma or teachings of Buddhism, which are the path, and in the Sangha, the community of practitioners who follow the path. Renunciation is utterly and absolutely necessary if we wish to practice the teaching of the Buddha. This theme runs through the entire path from beginning to end. At the Vajrayana level, renunciation is connected with devotion to the teacher, the Vajrayana master, or the Vajra master. Devotion to the teacher in the Vajrayana demand, demands a total surrender of ego, the complete renunciation of all clinging to self. Now, the Tibetan term for renunciation is ninjong, which means having found certainty. And um, in the Padmakara translation group, um, they would use the term determination to be free. And this is actually what we're talking about here, this determination that's based on seeing what's what, what is, what is worthwhile, what's not worthwhile, what is samsara, and what is freedom. So the key to that then in, at the Vajrayana, in the Vajrayana teaching is then our engagement with the teacher, the developing the discipline of devotion and the, the, the blessing of the teacher and so forth. So that's really the foundation of the Vajrayana. And that is then the, the, um, what we're talking about here in terms of uh, renunciation, determination to, to, um, to engage in the path of freedom. Okay, all right, I think we're heading towards the very end of the today. So we'll just take the last questions. One last question. Is sexual abuse of new naive students by an inebriated guru consistent with enlightenment? Of course not. Of course not. But what we have in our culture presently is um, a fascination with the exotic that has led many people to be very uncritical. Uh, and also, you could say, not even a fascination with the exotic, but just the general lack of uh, understanding of what enlightenment is, what's the, 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 the nature of the path, and so forth. Um, we have a situation of Buddhism being translated between uh, two cultures. So, so, the, um, so we have had situations where uh, you could say teachers who weren't genuine teachers um, promoting themselves and abusing students. So, of course, uh, in the case of someone like Chögyam Trungpa, here we're not talking about um, we're not talking about someone like that. Uh, Trungpa Rinpoche was a tremendous uh, teacher, and his his uh, activity in the 1970s, of course, nowadays being sort of reinterpreted according to our politically correct standards, um, is sometimes being read, and we can find you know articles on the web and so forth that sort of 
question from Trungpa in that regard. But uh, personally, from having been around uh, the students of Trungpa uh, and having been around Tibetan Buddhist teachers for uh, close to five decades now, uh, I found nothing except just, in the case of genuine teachers, complete integrity. And the, I have no, no, no doubt that Trungpa uh, activity entirely came from a place of no self, but very much from a gregarious, compassionate, warm wish to engage with the students. And in the 1970s culture of the US uh, and also England, it was a very different situation. So, so, um, so we shouldn't then ever, ever sort of associate Trungpa Rinpoche with some of the more sort of, um, uh, you could say, confused teachers that have been around and also which where there then have been various scandals and so forth. So, so it's, 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 um, it's, it's, we, we need, of course, you could say this is a legitimate question, but also we, it needs to be understood in, in context. So then, then the, <laughs> then the question continues. How are we to develop faith and devotion with that knowledge? Well, there's certainly, we should never ever have faith in someone who is not enlightened. So, um, if we're approaching the teaching, then there has to be complete trust that the teacher is the Buddha and that the teacher represents uh, complete integrity, wisdom, and compassion. So in the case of Chigam Trumba, I definitely don't have uh, any doubt that Trumpa Rinpoche was entirely such a great teacher. Um, and... Uh, and for us then to presently engage in this study, I think we, we uh, there's, if the more we would look into the life uh, and the activity of Chugam Trumpa, the more we would uh, engender this kind of faith and devotion. So that's the way to develop faith and devotion is to, if, if it's in the case of someone like Trumpa Rinpoche, the more we would look at his life and activity, the more we would generate faith and devotion. Um, then it's sometimes hugely challenging to stay mindful to these teachings with that knowledge. Yeah, but um, certainly in the case of approaching Vajrayana, uh, we don't just look at the teaching, but we also very much look at the teacher. And really, it is key, really, to what we're talking about here, the renunciation and so forth, uh, to have this kind of uh, faith and devotion. But that being said, our faith and devotion should not be based on uncritical acceptance. It should really be um, based on scrutiny. But that's where if we, the more we would scrutinize the life and activity of Trungpa Rinpoche, the more I think we would develop faith and devotion. Um, so is there a link to a Dropbox? Yes, it's the same as, I think it's the same as what we've had so far. Let me just check, but there is in the mail that's that I've sent out, there would be a, um, there would be a link to a Dropbox. Uh, students of Trungpa Rinpoche were always given a chance to say no. In those days, we were very loose with sex. Well, exactly. And I am I'm very much, even though I didn't meet Trungpa Rinpoche, I've been a lot around Trungpa Rinpoche Sangha a lot. And, you know, it was, it was not a problem as such. <laughs> okay. It's a good thing we're bringing this up at this point, but it's a it's it's a legitimate question. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So yes. A uh, quick practical question: Should I be seeing anything on the screen apart from you? Yeah, you should be seeing the text. Uh, hopefully, you can minimize the view of me, and you can also, I think, get rid of it entirely. Uh, I'm following a copy of my own book, Journey Without Goal. That's good, but no, you should actually. Uh, you, I don't know what's going on, but the, the 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 screen. What you should see is actually my desktop, where you see a picture of Trumper uh, and then the uh, the text. So I'm not quite sure how to. This hasn't actually come up before, but it's yeah. That's also a legitimate question. Uh, there is a way of doing it though. Um, Look, shoot me a mail and I'll, I'll get you onto the, there's an 800 number you can call and they can, they can help you through explaining what's, what's happening and what should be happening. Yeah? Okay. All right. Okay. Okay, so we'll conclude with dedication.
Okay, somebody's saying there's, I can't see any drink, link to a Dropbox in an email. Can you resend? Okay, I'll get onto that. Okay, good. Through this virtue, may all beings throughout existence awaken together without a single being left behind. In the pure realm of the luminous essence, the ground of the great perfection, may they remain inseparable from the kayas and wisdoms. Through all our births, wherever we may be born, may we be endowed with the seven good qualities of the higher realms. As soon as we're born, may we meet with the Dharma and have the freedom to practice it properly. At that time, may we please the holy gurus and practice the Dharma throughout the day and night. Realizing the Dharma and accomplishing its essential meaning, may we cross the ocean of existence in that life. Thoroughly teaching the holy Dharma in this world, may we never tire of accomplishing the benefit of others. By this vast benefit of others, without partiality or bias, may all attain Buddhahood together. <laughs>